Hello everybody and welcome back to the second part of the Alex's Mobs Showcase. Today we are going through 29 more mobs which are in Alex's Mobs, which were added in updates 1.5 to 1.13, which includes their own boss. So don't forget to like and subscribe and let's get into the good stuff. So to start off with, I forgot to mention bear dust in the previous video. So it has a very rare chance to drop when you kill a bear. When you use this item, it will emit a meme noise. So just enjoy having fun with this item. The first mob today is the Snow Leopard, which was first to release in the 1.5 update. This mob can be found sitting or lying in the snowy mountains of the world. You won't have to fear them if you come across them, as they are neutral mobs who will only attack if provoked. If you get lucky, you can watch it in action, as it will try to take down a sheep, its prey. If you're even more lucky, you may find that the mob it kills will drop even more loot than usual due to its great hunting abilities. If you have any moose ribs on you, you can give it to them to breed them. However, they are untamable. The next mob is the Spectre, which is the phantom-like creature only found in the end. This mob is completely peaceful and can only be damaged via magic, such as splash potions. These peaceful creatures will just be flying throughout the end and if you have a soul heart on you, you can lure one to you. This is a great chance to attach a lead to the Spectre, as you can now safely navigate through the end. Although, you may want to know that you can't control where the Spectre is flying to, so just hope it's somewhere you want to be. You can interact with the lead or just sneak to drop from the Spectre, but make sure to grab your lead on the way down. Next up we have the crow, which can be found in forests and plains. These loud pests can be a pain when you're trying to farm, as they are known to damage crops, so the best way to deal with this is to build a scarecrow, which literally consists of one carved pumpkin. Be careful not to leave any food unguarded however, as they will take it and eat it. Even though they are pests, they can be tamed if you throw enough pumpkin seeds to them. These wonderful companions are very useful for many reasons. If they do get injured, they can be healed by sitting on a hay block. If you interact with them to make them gather items and then they grab an item, it will try to find a chest or a furnace with an item frame with a corresponding item on it, so it can store it in there. A cool little feature is that the crow will attempt to sit on the owner's shoulders if they are set to follow. They will also defend their owner if they are attacked, dealing a small amount of damage, but they will deal more damage to undead enemies. The next mob we have is the Alligator Snapping Turtle, which is the first mob added in the 1.6 update. They can be found in swamps, but be careful when around them as they are fast creatures and they will attack you. You may be okay though if you keep your distance as they will very rarely move, making it so that moss starts to grow on their backs. If you're brave and quick enough, you can shear this and have a chance for it to drop a spiked scoot. This can be used to create a spiked turtle shell helmet, which increases knockback resistance and increases how long you can swim underwater for without taking a breath for another 15 seconds. It can also occasionally give you knockback to your attacks, and give you thorns. If you wish to breed the alligator snapping turtle, you can do so with raw cod. The next mob on this list is the mungus, which can be found in the mushroom fields. The shape of this mob may look familiar to you, and that is because it was inspired by the game Among Us. Apart from being sus, they are completely passive creatures. They can be seen with some mushrooms on their back, and if fed more of the same mushroom, they will grow more and more on them. If they have more than one mushroom, they can shoot a beam similar to the one of a guardian on the ground which will then plant more of that mushroom. If that mushroom is on mycelium, it has a chance to make it into a giant mushroom. Doing so will make some of the mushrooms on the mungus's back disappear. If you decided you want to kill the mungus whilst it has at least 5 mushrooms on its back, it will explode and turn the surrounding area into the biome which relates to the mushroom. Every so often, the mungus will drop a mungal spore, which when given to rabbits, will turn them into a bun fungus, but we'll get onto them in another video. You can also breed mungus with mungal spores. A cool little easter egg is that if you name a mungus drip, it will give the mungus some sneakers, which are a reference to the Among Us drip meme. You may remember me saying that if a crimson mosquito attacks the mungus, whilst it has warped mushrooms, the crimson mosquito will turn into the warped Moscow. If you are in creative, an easier way to do this is to use warped mixture on the Crimson Mosquito to instantly turn it into the Warped Moscow. The next mob on this list is the Mantis Shrimp, which can be found in a couple of variants in the reefs or the warm oceans and mangrove swamps. The Mantis Shrimp is a neutral creature and will attack in a very fast manner, so fast in fact that it can set enemies on fire. They can even launch enemies back and break through blocks. They will attack their prey naturally, which are squids, tropical fish, guardians and shulkers. What's great about this mob is that you can tame them with 10 to 30 tropical fish. Be careful though, as the Mantis Shrimp can only survive for a couple of minutes when they're out of water, so ensure you give them a water bucket so that they can stay out indefinitely. The Mantis Shrimp can be made to break blocks and will start to break blocks of the one it's given. It can go to a even break obsidian which saves a lot of time. If your shrimp friend does become injured, they can be healed with any type of fish. They can also be bred with lobster tails. A cool little easter egg is that if you have another mod installed which has rice, such as Farmer's Delight, you can give it to the mantis shrimp. If it's near a furnace or a smoker, it will then start to make shrimp fried rice. Next up is the Guster, which is the first mob added in the 1.7 update, and these guys can be found in deserts. They are completely hostile and will either throw sand at you, or if you get close enough to them, it will throw you up into the air, along with any items that are on the ground. These guys can appear in a reddish colour if they enter a desert with red sand, or if they gather soul sand, they can also turn into a darker variant to suit their surroundings. 
Don't try to kill these guys with arrows as they are almost not effective compared to hitting them with a melee weapon. If you do manage to kill them, they can have a chance to drop a Guster Eye, which can be used to create a pocket of sand and a gust maker. The pocket of sand can be used as a weapon which acts similarly to the way the guster attacks from afar. The gust maker is a machine that when activated with a redstone signal, releases a gust storm, which pushes mobs or items in the way it's facing. A cool little easter egg is that if you name a guster twister, it can give the guster some googly eyes. The next mob is the Warped Mosco, and can be classed as a mini boss considering the length you need to spawn this and how powerful it is. As I've already said, this spawns when a Crimson Mosquito sucks blood from the Mungus covered with Warped Fungus. This enemy is extremely powerful so make sure that you are fully prepared to take on this beast. It can attack in a range of different ways including one ability where they suck the blood of any nearby prey, healing it. If you do manage to kill this, you will be rewarded handsomely with Warped Muscle and Hemolymph Sacks. These can both be used to upgrade the Blood Sprayer into the Hemolymph Blaster, making it a much more powerful weapon. The next mob we have is the Straddler, which is a greyish type mod found in the Basalt Deltas. They can both swim in lava and water, while they'll often be found and will attack if anything gets too close. They will sling their strad poles towards the attacker, which will damage them. If you do manage to kill a Straddler, they can have a rare chance to drop Straddleite. You can then use this Straddleite to create Straddleboard, which is a form of travel when travelling through the lava lakes, meaning you can safely cross them. Well, maybe not safely, as if you do go too fast and crash into a wall, it will break, so make sure you have proper control over this when riding one. You can enchant this with some enchantment books but I will go through this in another video. Next up we have the Stradpole. Now you will remember me saying that Straddlers throw these little guys to damage any potential attackers, although they can be found in shallow lava pools in the Basalt Deltas. Make sure to bucket these guys up if you want them, as they will despawn if you don't. You can make them into an adult however, if you feed them Crimson Mosquito Larvae, but this will be hostile, which can make a great way to get Straddlite. They can also swim in water, but don't serve much of a purpose, so they may just be for show, if you wish to take them home. The next mob in this list is the Emu, which is the first of the mobs added in the 1.8 update, and can be found in flocks in the savannas and badlands. They are neutral creatures, but if you're going to attack them, do so with a melee weapon, as they can dodge any arrow thrown at them. Make sure not to get overwhelmed though, as some of their flock will retaliate. They are great at keeping any skeletons away though, as they can attack them if they see one. They can be fed wheat if you wish to breed them, and have three different variants, but the albino variant is much rarer than the other two. If you stay close enough to these guys for a while, they will drop an emu egg, which can be cooked and eaten. If you kill an emu, they have a chance to drop an emu feather, which can be created into outback leggings, which, when equipped, gives you a chance to dodge projectiles. Next up is the Platypus, and this is a neutral mob which can be found rarely in rivers. They will attack if provoked and can poison their attacker for a few seconds. The Platypus is attracted to redstone, so if you hold one in your hand, it will be attracted to you. You can feed it redstone, and when done so, it will go digging in clay. It can start digging up some clay balls and some maggots, but the amount can be greatly increased if you were to give it a whole redstone block. You can bucket up the Platypus like you can with most aquatic creatures, and you can also breed them with lobster tails. A cool little easter egg is that if you call the Platypus Perry, it can turn the Platypus into Perry the Platypus from Phineas and Ferb. Another cool little easter egg is that the Platypus can occasionally dig up a fedora, which you can wear. The next mob in this list is the Drop Bear, which is a hostile mob found on the roof of the nether. Be careful when exploring the nether waste as the Drop Bear can surprise attack you by dropping down from the ceiling. Once it is finished attacking, it will jump straight back up onto the ceiling, waiting for its next victim. If you do manage to kill this before it kills you, it can have a chance to drop a Drop Bear Claw, which can be used to create flint and steel, and it can be brewed with some awkward potions to create a potion of clinging. This allows the drinker to walk on ceilings like the Drop Bear would. You can also use the Drop Bear Claws to create a tendon whip, but we'll get onto that in another video. Next up is the Tasmanian Devil, which are neutral mobs rarely found in the temperate forest biomes. You may hear some weird noises coming from them, but you shouldn't have to worry unless you have attacked them. They will naturally attack rabbits and chickens, however, if you feed them rotten flesh, they will release a howl, which will scare away any nearby monsters. If you throw a bone at them, they will turn it into bone meal. These guys can be bred with any type of meat, however, they can't be tamed. The next mob is the kangaroo, which are neutral mobs found hopping in the savannas and badlands. They can sometimes be seen with joeys in their pouches too. If you decide that you wanted to attack one of these, well, you may be surprised how much damage they can deal, as you may not be around for that long before you realise you messed up. If you manage to kill it, however, it can drop some kangaroo meat, which can be cooked and eaten. But you can also use this cooked kangaroo meat to craft a kangaroo burger, 
which restores a lot more hunger and saturation. The kangaroo can also drop some kangaroo hide, which is used to craft outback leggings. If you wish to keep these guys alive, you can tame them with 10 to 15 carrots. These companions will be able to store a nice number of items in their pouch for you. But this isn't just for you, because if you place a sword in the pouch, the kangaroo will use it to protect you. If an adult kangaroo is given a helmet and a chest plate in their pouch, it will also wear this for protection. You can heal the kangaroo if it gets injured, if vegetables are also placed in their pouch, but you can also heal them if you interact with them. I find that this is definitely one of the best mechanics in this mod. If you wish to breed kangaroos, you can do so with dead bush or grass. A little easter egg is that if you name a kangaroo Roger, a small halo will hover above the kangaroo's head. Similarly, if you name a gorilla Harambe. The next mob is the first mob in the 1.9 update, and can be found in the lukewarm, cold, and deep oceans called the Catchlot Whale. They will be swimming searching for squid to eat. They do so by using echolocations, and will ram and eat the squid. It can have a small chance to drop a whale tooth when this happens, and this can be used to create an echolocator, which we will go on to later. The whale can break any ice it swims through, making it an unstoppable force, especially when it's charging, as it can break boats and wood. Another rarer variant of the whale is the all-white whale, which is much stronger than the average whale. You may remember me saying in the previous video that orcas like to attack Catchlot whales. Well, they will attack their young, and the parent will do their best to protect it by fighting back. When a thunderstorm occurs, there is a chance for a catchlot whale to be beached, making them extremely vulnerable. You can actually save them if you push them back into deep enough water. If you do this without hurting the catchlot whale, it has a chance to reward you with some ambergris. This can be traded with fishermen villagers for some nice loot. But you can also use this to craft an echolocator. These devices are used to locate nearby caves. Follow the sound waves and it will take you straight to it, but use this wisely as it only has a certain number of uses. You can use the echolocator in crafting to craft yourself an endolocator, which will take you to an end portal when you are near or in a stronghold. The next mob we have on our list is the leafcutter ant, which can be found in jungles. They can often be seen carrying leaves and taking it back to their ant hill. There are two types of ants, the workers and the queens. You will only see a maximum of 20 workers outside the anthill gathering items to take back to the anthill, but the queen can be summoned if you stomp on the anthill. When there is a queen in their anthill, there is a chance for another worker to spawn every five leaves that are brought back to the anthill, whilst it has less than 10 ants. They are unable to repopulate if there is no queen. If you decide to dig beneath the anthill, you may come across leafcutter ant chamber blocks, and when the worker ants gather enough leaves, you can interact with the chamber block to give you Gonjilidia, but make sure that a streamlight is present, otherwise you are going to annoy a lot of ants, and the whole colony will become hostile. You can eat the Gonjilidia, which doesn't restore much hunger, but does saturate it. You can feed this to any of the ants to heal it. However, if the colony is annoyed, you can feed it to pacify them. If you decide to break the anthill, there is a small chance that a leafcutter ant pupa will drop, which, when planted into the ground, will create a new anthill and colony. The next mob on our list is the Enderiophage, which is a neutral mob found flying in the end. They are very hostile towards endergrays and will kill them if they see one. When it does attack, it will afflict the victim with enderflu, which, when expires, will spawn new Enderiophages, and the victim will pretty much die. This isn't an instant effect, so you will have 10 minutes to get yourself a chorus fruit or milk to cure yourself from this debuff. If you have some chorus fruit to spare, you can give this to any other creature that are also inflicted with enderflu. Once the Enderiophage has attacked, it will seek out an enderman to steal one of its eyes, as the Enderiophage's eyes will shatter it will be unable to attack again if it doesn't have an eye. If the Enderiophage is defeated, it can drop a Capsid, and this can be used to store up to a stack of items in it. However, if another inventory type block, such as a chest, is placed above it, the items will be placed into that block. If a Capsid is placed above it, the items will float up into that Capsid. You can also use a Capsid to create an Enderiophage rocket, which can be used instead of fireworks when flying with an Elytra. If you wanted to, you can actually create an Enderiophage if you place a Capsid with an Eye of Ender inside, on top of a vertical end rod. There are a couple more things you can do with the capsid, you can put a current of mosquito larvae into it, and you will gain a mysterious worm, which we will go on to later in the video. You can place a raw cod into it and get cosmic cod, which we will also go on to later in the video. You can also put any music disc in this, and it will give you a new music disc called Days by Ludo Crypt. And I don't want to play it due to copyright reasons, but you should definitely go and listen to it as it's a nice tune. Another thing is that there are two other variants of the Enderio phase, when they are present in the overworld and the nether. The next mob in this list is the Bald Eagle, which can be found flying in the wooded mountains and is the first mob added to the 1.10 update. These guys can be seen diving into lakes and attempting to grab salmon that swim in there, as well as swooping down to catch rabbits also. You can actually tame a Bald Eagle if you give it fish oil, and an amazing feature is that you can use the Bald Eagle for falconry. In the previous video, I showed you that you can create a falconry glove and a falconry hat, both of which is needed. The glove is for you to equip, so that you can command the Bald Eagle, and the hood is for the Eagle to wear, so that when you command it to fly, you can control it. You can fly up to 150 
actually blocks away from yourself. This is another one of my favourite mechanics in this mod. If you wish to stop flying, you can sneak, but your bald eagle will naturally return to you if you surpass the 150 block distance. If your companion is injured, it can be healed with any fish. You can also breed the bald eagle with rotten flesh. Next up is the tiger, and these guys can be found in or around bamboo jungles. Be careful when approaching them as they will attack you if you're not. To make it even harder, they can become pretty much invisible when stalking prey, and when they jump out to attack, their victim is frozen in fear for a couple of seconds, unable to move. You can slightly pacify these animals however if you feed them chicken, pork chops or any type of raw meat. This will give you the tiger's blessing which won't only give you the freedom to walk close to them without being their lunch, but also will come to protect you if you are attacked. Don't get too comfortable though as the tiger's blessing doesn't last forever, meaning that you either need to keep feeding it or keep your distance, but make sure not to injure them as they will attack you and you will lose the blessing. You can breed the tigers if you feed them in case you blossom, and you have a rare chance for the baby tiger to be a white one. The next mob on this list is the tarantula hawk, and these guys can be found flying in the desert biomes, looking for prey. Don't fret though, as they're only interested in spiders, unless of course you hit them. When they attack spiders, they will sting them, which will immobilize them for a short time. This is when the tarantula hawk will then drag it and bury it in the ground. If the target is an arthropod, it will paralyze them with the debilitating sting debuff, but if you are not, it will only take you down to half your health, but giving the same debuff. This doesn't make them an easy fight though, as they are very erratic. You can tame a tarantula hawk if you feed them 15 to 25 spider eyes. If you gain two tamed tarantula hawks, you can breed them with fermented spider eyes, and they will then seek out a spider to bury. When some time has passed, after the spider has been buried, a baby tarantula hawk will emerge from the ground. If they are bred in the nether, a new variant will spawn. You can heal tarantula hawks with flowers. If instead you kill the tarantula hawk, it can drop a tattered tarantula hawk wing, and when you place 9 in a crafting table, you can create a tarantula hawk wing. This can be crafted with an elytra to give you the tarantula hawk elytra, which upgrades it to 3 armor points, more durability, and makes it enchantable. We are now onto the next update, which is the 1.11 update, and as the first boss, the Void Worm. This can only be summoned in the end when a mysterious worm is thrown into the void. In case you forgot, you can get this by putting a Crimson Mosquito larvae into a capsid. It attacks in a range of different ways. It can launch up to 4 homing crystals, similar to ones that Shulkers launch, but deals a lot more damage. It can also attack close range and bite through anything in its way. Don't think that you can hide though, as it can enter a portal and teleport to get what it wants. If you do manage to get a couple of hits off its body, make sure you know what you're doing, otherwise it will split into another Void Worm, and will keep doing so unless you aim for the head. To make it a little easier though, the health will be halved, so you don't have to fight another fully health Void Worm. Once all have been defeated, its loot will glow and be surrounded in Ender Residue, making it much easier to locate its drops. It will drop a void worm eye and two void worm mandibles. The eye can be crafted with some mandibles and netherite ingots to create a dimensional carver, which, when used, will carve a hole through reality, giving you an easy way out of the end. But the portal will stay open for a short time in case you want to go back. Do not use this when you don't need to though, as it only has 20 uses. You can use the mandibles that the void worm drops to create a void worm beak which can then be crafted into a Void Worm Ifigi. As well as this being a trophy, it can also be used with redstone to damage any nearby mob in reach. Now, back onto some regular mobs, and the next one on our list is the Frilled Shark. This aquatic creature can be found swimming in the deep oceans and are neutral. They will hunt blobfish and squids naturally. They can lure the squids in the deepest oceans with their teeth, as they will go for any sort of light. The Frilled Shark will then strike and give the target the Exsanguination debuff, which drains the target's health. They can shed their teeth when they attack, similarly to Catchlot Whales and Hammerhead Sharks, and you can get yourself a serrated shark tooth. They can be crafted to create the Shield of the Deep. Not only does this have more durability than the regular shield, when blocking attacks, the attacker will be inflicted with the Exsanguination debuff. If you wish to take the Frilled Shark with you, you can bucket them up. Similarly to Blobfish, if the Frilled Shark is in less than 10 blocks of water, they will become more discoloured and actually slower than when it's not. But hey, at least you can fix the skin by giving it a new one if you name the Frilled Shark Kamata Khan, which is a cool little easter egg. Next up we have the Mimic Octopus, which are peaceful mobs found in warm oceans. Good luck when trying to find one of these, as they can become very camouflaged with their surroundings. If you manage to find it, you can tame it with lobster tails, but this is only when they are not camouflaged. Now that it is tamed, you can take it onto land, but make sure to give it slime balls every couple of days, otherwise it will dry out. You can control whether you want your Mimic Octopus to change form when it wants, with ink sacs. This is where the fun begins, as you can change your little friend into certain mobs which will mimic their attacks, but you must first give it at least 5-8 to eight Mimic Cream before doing so. If given a Prismarine Shard, it will take the form of a Guardian. When you give it a Pufferfish, it will mimic a Pufferfish. If you give it Gunpowder, it can then mimic a Creeper. This is again one of my favourite mechanics. Tamed Mimic Octopi can be bucketed up and bred with Tropical Fish, but make sure that you keep your new friend away from Mantis Shrimps and Frilled Sharks as they are natural enemies. 
The next mob on the list is the Seagull, which can be found on beaches and is the only mob added in the 1.12 update. They are passive, but they are a nuisance as they will steal and eat food from your hand or if it's in your hotbar, but they will also take any food left on the ground. However, these birds can be useful because if you have a treasure map in your offhand and throw a lobster tail onto the ground, it will eat it and in return sit directly above the blocks of where the buried treasure is, making your life so much easier. If you have any cod, you can breed the seagulls. A cool little easter egg is that if you name a seagull Wingull, it will have some blue and white feathers in relation to Wingull in Pokemon. Onto the final update in this video, we have the Frost Stalker, which were added in update 1.13. They can be found in herds roaming in the ice spikes and frozen peaks of the overworld. It is a hostile mob, but will focus its attack on Tusculins. It attacks in a similar way to a hammerhead shark as it will circle its enemy before lashing out and attacking it. If the Frost Stalker is injured, it will defend itself by shaking off the ice spikes on its back, but they can regenerate these if they go into water. When not gathering more ice for their back, they can freeze the water beneath them. If you can kill a Frost Stalker, it will have a chance to drop a Frost Stalker horn, which can be crafted into a Frost Stalker helmet. This can then be equipped to pacify any Frost Stalkers. Be warned as if you do attack the Frost Stalker, your cover will be blown and the whole herd will attack you. You can only breed Frost Stalkers if you wear the Frost Stalker helmet with pork chops. If Frost Stalkers enters a warm biome, their ice sparks will melt off and they will be inflicted with weakness. Next on our list is the Tusklin, which can be found in cold, flat biomes. If you do get too close to a Tusklin, they will go after you and fling you into the air and away, but won't pursue you. You can pacify Tusklins if you feed them a brown mushroom, and if you do manage to get to it with a saddle, you can actually ride them for a short amount of time, but they will throw you off. You can breed Tusklins with red mushrooms, and occasionally, the baby Tusklins will dig up brown mushrooms. When you barter with Piglins, you have a small chance to be given ancient hog shoes, and when ridden on a Tusklin, can make your ride longer without being thrown off. You can also enchant these boots to make the Tusklins that bit more powerful. Next on our list is the Leviathan, and these peaceful creatures can be found swimming in the lava lakes in the nether. This massive reptile can be ridden if you equip it with a stradalite saddle and a stradalite tack. As the Leviathan is so big, it can hold up to four passengers. The tack allows you to control the Leviathan, so it has less of a chance to flee into the lava, away from potential danger, but killing you and everyone in the process. The Leviathan can lure crimson mosquitoes by releasing smoke from its back, and then eat them when they are close enough. If the Leviathan is exposed to water, it will solidify and become more stronger than its original form. If you're if does get injured, you can heal it with magma cream. You can also breed Leviathans with Crimson Mosquito Larvae. On to our final mob today, and this is called the Cosmore, and these are rarely found flying in the end. They are neutral creatures and will go to anything that has Cosmore Cod. Again, this is made if you put Cod into a Capsid, or this can just be found flying around in schools in the end, but we'll get onto them in the next video. You can tame a Cosmore by feeding them many Cosmic Cod, and although they will not defend you in combat, it will prevent you from falling into the void by bringing you up back safely onto land. If you wish to have more of these, you can breed them with Cosmic Cod once they are tamed, and can be healed with Chorus Fruit. If you wish to take it home, it can swim under underwater if given a water breathing potion. That's it from me today, thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed. The final part of this showcase is coming soon and I will be including the enchantment books and extra things like the banner patterns so I can cover everything in this mod. If I did miss anything about these mobs, make sure to let us know in the comments down below. If you want to suggest me a mod to showcase, please leave a comment down below or join my discord server and suggest one to me there and I'll catch you all in the next video.